Welcome to another interview episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I am very pleased to welcome two gentlemen today. And now, uh, both of them are veterans of the industry. Uh, if you listened to our last interview episode, you already heard uh, from one of our guests, uh, Servan. And I'm probably going to, I, I, I got it right last time. I don't know if I'm going to get it right two times in a row. Uh, Kyonjan. No, did I get it? Yeah, I, I killed right. it this time, that's, didn't I? That's, that's perfect. Okay, good. Uh, who was the, if not uh, a key, if not the, uh, original developer of what would become Direct 3D. And we're also joined by Casey. And again, uh, you just told me how to do it, and now my brain is fried. Uh, <laughs> oh, crap. You'll now, get and, it. You'll uh, get it. I believe in you. You believe in me. <laughs> and believe in my general existence or believe in my capabilities to not all screw of, this up? All of the above. All of the above. Oh, now that's too much pressure. That that is way too much pressure. Okay, uh, Muratori. Perfect. Or did I kill it? Okay, perfect. Casey Muratori, uh, who is a, a veteran game developer, uh, and he is going to be representing. We're not really doing this as a debate, but uh, at back in the day in the mid mid to late 90s when 3d accelerator cards were proliferating there were a lot of different apis to be able to access this new technology this way of enhancing uh, a home a computer and ibm pc primarily uh, video capabilities and those main two apis were OpenGL and direct 3d we have of course creator of the original Direct 3D and somebody who worked with and was a proponent back then of OpenGL. Now, though we're not doing the uh, schoolyard battles. Uh, this isn't going to be a replication of Spectrum versus C64, or Atari ST versus Amiga type of nonsense. But what we do want to get is some historical perspective on where these APIs came from, what was their development, why were certain decisions made? What was the view back then of the pros and cons of those decisions? And try to get a little bit of perspective of how those influenced the development of the video game industry then and today. So, uh, gentlemen, how do you, I think we should start off with a general overview of where the APIs came from originally. Just maybe that'll give us some perspective because they did not start as creations for home hardware, correct? Yeah, um, OpenGL was around from Silicon Graphics, and it was really a workstation Unix-based API that was used for all the really high-end CAD. I mean, and if you wanted to do 3D, um, you would buy a machine like a Silicon Graphics. It was a dedicated piece of hardware. And OpenGL was the interface that you got to access that. It was also, I believe, because of that hardware, what the academic world quite heavily used, what they knew. I think there were a few other APIs around, um, I think Biggs, and there were, there, were, there were a few other APIs, but OpenGL was one that had good hardware support because of Silicon Graphics. And I think that's really why it became a discussion. Okay. Now, so, this time, just to add something yeah. to that uh, from the background perspective. So OpenGL was not the original API. The original API was called IrisGL, and it was a Silicon Graphics internal API specifically for their hardware that you really only used on Silicon Graphics hardware. And to that extent, you can see uh, a lot of kind of how it works being tightly related to how the Silicon Graphics hardware originally worked. So, for example, there's uh, people who remember this era of computing uh, will remember calls like GL Vertex and GL TexCord, for example, which are things that very few people would ever call today. Uh, and which are, I believe, deprecated even in the current specs of OpenGL. 
But at that time, those were ways of the CPU basically directly outputting. I believe they even at one point, I could be wrong about this. Someone from Silicon Graphics would really be necessary to, to really answer here. But I believe those kinds of things compiled to direct machine instructions where the CPU would literally send stuff directly to the graphics code processor, like without calling any APIs. There was no call involved. It was just uh, a literal like operation. And so, you know, that was really where OpenGL came from. It was SGI sort of opening, quote unquote, their internal language, but it was designed for their hardware, for them. And basically the entire design, as far as I'm aware, was just basically done to support Silicon Graphics hardware, period. It was not designed as a 3D graphics API for a series of cards, uh, which is more of what Servon was doing, right? Like it was not designed trying to be for multiple people, at least not originally. Okay, so now this is an interesting point because Silicon Graphics hardware, obviously if you're, as a kid back in the 90s, teenager, I when I heard the word Silicon Graphics, that meant one thing to me, which was pre-rendered graphics, no real-time processing of stuff. Now, uh, from a technical standpoint, did that make a difference in the, the way the API, uh, this OpenGL, was structured that there's a certain way of doing of getting the result if you're doing it pre-rendered you've got time or there's a certain way to do it if you have to do it in real time that would have influenced the architecture of, uh, of OpenGL at that point. The OpenGL is more for the real time for the hardware side of things. If you're talking about the pre-rendered stuff what you'd be doing with the hardware is say positioning Maybe it was even a wireframe model running in the hardware, or you could be filling it in, but then you hit the render button. So it was for the fast preview. And then the render would be passed it over to a ray tracer, and that would probably run on the CPU at the, in those days. And that's what would be doing the pre-render, or there'd be a render farm of many SGI boxes that would be doing that. Yeah, okay. the so reason you probably done. have that association with them is because Silicon Graphics workstations were the only thing with that kind of hardcore 3D acceleration that was sort of standard that you could buy with modeling programs on them. So things like Soft Image uh, or Alias. Um, and, you know, this is before Maya, but they had a thing called, uh, oh gosh, and I'm forgetting the name, uh, Alias. Oh, God. So there's a precursor to Maya. I can't believe I'm so old that I'm forgetting the name. Maya came about in my, like, tenure. I, like, remembered seeing it. But they, they had a previous thing, and I can't – I'm blanking it was on the, the name. Two I'll, of I'll look it up and put a link in the show notes. All over. It was, it was yes. the two of them merged to form Maya. Yeah, there's Alias and there was Wavefront. They became yes. Alias Wavefront. They made Maya, uh, but there was stuff before that. It was, like – it wasn't called uh, – yeah, I'm sorry. I can't remember the name of it. But, Not a problem. Um, the reason that you have that association is because of that. So if you were somebody who was working on, you know, like at uh, Industrial Light and Magic or something, and you're talking about making pre-rendered stuff, well, all of the modeling is taking place in real time because the artists have to, you know, sculpt these things. They're sculpting them on Silicon Graphics workstations. It doesn't even mean that they're necessarily doing the pre-rendered work. The pre-rendered work could have been work happening on something else uh, because if it was running a ray tracer or something that has nothing to do with Silicon Graphics hardware. So, you know, that part was separate, but it, it got sort of that name synonymous with it. And in fact, one of the things I listened to the show from last time you sent me the early uh, copy of it, one of the reasons like Servon was mentioning that like there's an OpenGL group at Microsoft and OpenGL was running on NT351 the reason for that was because NT351, there were certain factions inside Microsoft fairly high up. I want to say Nathan Mirvold was like very interested in this for some reason and pushing it was they wanted to challenge Silicon Graphics for that prestige spot because it is a prestige spot. It is not a lot of units. It's a prestige spot um, of we are the big iron that Hollywood uses to like model stuff and that CAD people use. And so the whole reason that that OpenGL was there when Servon got to Microsoft was not because anyone was thinking about games or any of that stuff. It was because they were thinking about NT workstation and we want to challenge that. And to that end, Microsoft bought Soft Image. They actually purchased the company. 
brought them in-house to a certain extent and did the port to Windows NT and then later spun them back off. Again, all for this, this purpose. And that was in the 92, 93 time frame, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. So that is, okay, thank you. That actually puts it all into perspective. So we're always talking about something that was designed for real-time rendering uh, or real-time interaction with the 3D models. Uh, that that's that was one one big question I had. So now, uh, Servan, you've got the 900 pound gorilla of the industry, so to speak, uh, Silicon Graphics with their standard, and there are other APIs popping up now. Your uh, your company at the time is creating uh, a general purpose API uh, that's supposed to be running on multiple different. Uh, GPUs uh, and the GPU concept or terminology probably didn't exist yet at this point, correct? GPU didn't exist, no. No, no. it was just like 3D cards or 3D chips. Um, gotcha. Or uh, Casey just used the graphic coprocessor. I love that phrase. That was yeah. that was nice. So um, now I guess we're talking uh, 92, 93 when this is still being done on the big workstations. Uh, the, that the moment that it starts influencing gamers, uh, we the first big 3D hardware is obviously in the arcade. Uh, is there? Do we know if there's any uh, influence from uh, these standard workstation APIs on things like Sega's uh, Virtua series or uh, the early uh, Namco games like Ridge Racer? Are they using any of that technology to your knowledge or is that their own internal stuff happening my understanding is that nearly all those games the uh the, the arcade games are built really custom hardware and the games are coded directly to them you don't need an api um, an api is what you need if you're going to have different hardware or different types of soft different software teams hitting the same lower level system if okay. you're um, making the latest sort of arcade box with a specific game in mind on top of it, you'll just get the best chips you've got. And your team and the hardware side knows how to put those guys, those chips together. Do the texture mapping. They're, they're just picking the chips that can do it and, ex and getting the fastest speeds on that and then building a game right on top of it. Gotcha. So you, you don't need an API and you don't want an API. You don't want anything to get in the way, really. The API is the um, specs on the hardware. Okay. So at what point then, and Casey, I have to ask, what is your role in the industry in this early 90s time period? I mean, nothing. Like the only reason I even know this stuff is I interned at Microsoft when I was like 16 or something. And I just happened to be at like the the place that I was interning, the building I was interning, happened to have in it uh, Chris Hecker, who was working on WinG at the time, and Steve Coy, who was one of the main guys doing the port of the Softimage code base to Windows. And so I got a lot of perspective on exactly the thing we're talking about and almost nothing else. Like I couldn't tell you a single other thing about Microsoft at that time period but I can tell you a ton about the OpenGL and the uh, also the, the 2D side. So WinG, which then basically set the stage for uh, direct draw, which came later uh, as sort of the, the follow on to that. And, uh, and so I happened to see all of that stuff when I was very young, but I was irrelevant. You know, I wasn't doing anything interesting. I was just a kid. I didn't know uh, if any of this stuff was good or bad or whatever. The OpenGL stuff happens a little later. Um, I mean, the sorry, the OpenGL Direct 3D sort of squabbles happen later uh, when I'm actually sort of more in the industry proper. But in these these the early times we're talking about now, uh, and Servant's not at Microsoft at this point. This is before anyone's really even thinking about doing 3D for games in that way. Uh, it's not a thing. So, yeah. Yeah. But at so, this time, yeah. um, I was running Rendomorphics, and we were an API company. We were making what you'd now call an engine, but we didn't call it an engine in those days. We were making an API that 
games would use and lots of other industries would use for 3D graphics. Um, and in fact, WinG was one of the things we were looking at using. So there is some relevance there. Because it came OK, out and and I, I got to ask, OK, what was WinG? Uh, you said it was a precursor to direct draw, but I, I've never heard of it before. This is the first time I'm hearing of WinG. Well, like I said in the last talk, when you wanted to do games on Windows, it was not very doable. Um, and one of the re reasons to do that, say you had an image you wanted to put on the screen. You couldn't access the screen directly. You had to draw the image into one piece of memory and then ask Windows to take it across onto the graphics card. And that was a really slow process. So WinG was the first official method where games studios could actually write to the memory that was going to be used for the display. So right, this Casey, is that the best way of describing it? Yeah, I, I mean, depending on how much technical information you want to go into, because I know you said that was a little bit flexible, uh, I can give you a more sort of like, I can give you an explanation of why this was the case, if anyone cares. Uh, but if yeah, not, definitely. we can move. Okay. It, it, oh. it hit me. If you guys, if you guys got the time. Sure. This this is fascinating now. And are we talking Windows 3.1 at this point? Or yes, we are. Um, so what happens in the PC space uh, is, and you'll forgive me for not. Uh, I was a person who programmed on the Amiga before moving to PC, so I missed a little bit of the earlier stuff. But um, the landscape at that time is you have to kind of understand where CPUs are at versus like how much computation, how many reads and writes to memory are you going to be able to do per pixel on the screen, right? Because this is always kind of a very important thing to keep in mind when you're talking about history, because nowadays it's very common, uh, the computing that people experience, it has the horsepower to do a tremendous number of memory reads and writes and a tremendous number of floating point multiply ads and all these other things per pixel on the screen. And, and it's important to remember that when we're talking about going all the way back and like the kind of code that Servon was writing or what, what you know people like John Carmack were working at the time, we're talking about a massively scaled back to where you really weren't going to be able to do very much at all per pixel on the screen. Like the number of actual operations or the number of memory reads and writes you could do was minuscule compared to today. So you have to kind of shift your mind back to that period in order for a lot of these things that I'm gonna to say to make sense. But what you had at that time was games which were written on DOS, uh, they would be able to put the computer into a standardized mode, it's called mode 13H usually, cause that was the hex code. I mean, there's also called mode X. There was a, yeah. there was another one. I, their chained mode was a, like, they had all these different names for different things, but there were different ways that you would turn on these modes that you could write to them. And one of them could do double buffered and one of them couldn't. And you should get an IBM PC person from this era to tell you the exact specifics of that. Cause it was, it was a little bit before I switched over. But the point is, what they got when they switched into that mode was something where the CPU could write either to a single buffered or a double buffered 320 by 240 yeah. or something display, right? 320, 240. And it, this was standard. They could count on it being there in basically all IBM PCs. And that right there is the crucial thing. Totally. Now, nobody standardized what happens when you go beyond that. So graphics cards, there were many that could be in computers. They, the BIOS and everything always supported this, these modes. But when you started talking about 640 by 480 or 1280 by 720 or any of these other modes that they might have had uh, at that time, graphics cards could do things differently. They could, they could provide other kinds of interfaces to them that were not necessarily standardized. And as a result, what you had was when you looked at a system like Windows, which was running on higher resolution displays, there was no standard way to just expose, here is the memory surface or here is the pixel format that the display is going to be able to accept natively. Because unlike the previous like simple 320 by 240 modes, it wasn't standardized anymore. Now, again, 
you'd have to get a, a PC person on who like has more familiarity with that time period to tell you why this happened. But I guess it was just a lack of standardization. Maybe Vesa wasn't doing what they uh, should have. I don't know. I can give a little bit of background on this. Okay. The 320 by 240 standard was the VGA standard established by IBM. Yeah, but it's, why it didn't carry, I don't know. Uh, well, because, because there weren't IBM high reses in the market. There weren't because high resolution. Oh, sorry. There weren't high resolutions in the standards. So each different graphics card company was producing their own options for doing the higher res and higher and, color displays. And it had to do with the fact that once IBM basically gets dethroned and it becomes the mm. PC compatible and you don't have one company setting the new standard and moving the ball forward one step at a time, suddenly it's hurting cats. And and it took and this is probably going to be part of the conversation we're going to have about the APIs here in just a few minutes. Once IBM is no longer I see the king, the wars about standardization between companies like Dell and Hewlett Packard and so forth, those are battles that rage for years until they finally established what was known as super vga i i still remember friends of mine in this time trying to buy video cards and it just becomes this nightmare of figuring out well which game is going to work with what and what can you actually run on this and which can't you run and because the standardization gets blown out of the water when ibm finally uh, uh it gets dethroned and is no longer making the calls so uh now we get to the part that i can tell you um, correctly, which is what WinG was. So WinG is, we come to the point where Windows 351 uh, and Windows for Workgroups, uh, whatever that, that stuff was, uh, that, that tranche right before Windows 95 uh, comes out. So this is maybe two years before Windows 95 comes out, I want to say. The idea behind WinG is, well, if we could have a system that knew about most of the graphics card formats that are currently existing in Windows drivers. What we could do is we could make something where you create a drawing surface that we know we can blit to the screen very quickly by having a number of specialized things that we have optimized inside Windows to get things from a drawing surface that a, uh, that a programmer could work with you know, something that looked a lot like the old mode 13 or chained mode or any of those sorts of things. So it's just like eight bit uh, pixels in a linear address space that you can just write to. And we can get those to the screen very quickly. And so what that was designed to do was enable game developers to actually port their games, which had render loops that worked that way, right? That were writing to linear uh, eight bit per pixel address spaces and get them onto the screen just like they could in DOS, and that was the missing piece because prior to that in Windows, the only thing you had was a very slow, basically bitmap conversion blit that would be very slow and do like color mapping to the window standard colors so it would look wrong. You couldn't do like palette stuff correctly or whatever. So this was, WinG was just designed to be something that could do that interim. And it was replaced later by Direct Draw, which was trying to do one better, which was say, okay, now let's actually have you be able to write into a memory mapped, like a thing that's actually going to be read directly, potentially by the card or something like that. But WinG was the first step towards getting those fast splits so you could do games. And that's that's why it was created. It was created by Chris Hecker literally on a whim. Like he literally just, he wasn't supposed to be doing it. I think he got in a lot of trouble for it. Um, it was. But. It was totally needed, and at the time, the API that we were supplying used to have a whole load of drivers on DOS for doing this. And on Windows, we actually, there were some undocumented um, system calls into Windows that leaked out and people found out about them. And we were able to, before WinG came out, we were doing something very similar to what WinG was doing and providing it as a Windows 3.1 driver so but that would mean if the 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 game used that it wouldn't handle windows any any windows updates because it was using undocumented undocumented under the hood stuff 
So as soon as WinG was out there, you now had a legitimate method for doing this. But it was so important to do, we had to find a way to do it. And and this, I, I just so I understand it. So here we're talking about uh, games that are software rendering, uh, basically. Uh, you uh, running, moving stuff between CPU and video card, but the video card is essentially just outputting it to the screen. There's no actual processing of sprites yeah. or anything like, like this. Just now, when you think about video cards for games, in those days, the video card was dealing with how many colors and what resolution you could do. Whereas now you're thinking about how fast the triangles and the texture mapping. What was special is just more colors, more res. Gotcha. And okay. if you if you want a, a direct analogy to it, you can go look in the Windows API even today. So create dib section, which is basically the Windows 95 replacement for what WinG's functionality more or less was. Create dib section, drawing to that, and then calling bitblit or stretchblit. That's what WinG was before Windows 95. Um, and so, like, you know, you can really you can go recreate exactly what it was even to this day by just calling create dib section with a a, a bitmap format you specify you know an, an ARGB eight bit packed bit format and that's that's what WinG was was providing for the first time to Windows. Gotcha. The, the, it was critical for doing games on Windows mm -hmm. in any what I was trying to say in any forward compatible way because we had to do a ton of work to do it at all and it was not compatible forward when g enabled that okay now and so just to get a timeline uh how long is a uh, serve on how long is your solution your windows 3.1 solution out there before when g shows up um oh it's very high so we're going back probably six months to a year something like that okay okay so it's it, it, as far as game the games market is concerned that's a relatively long period of time but at the same time it's not that it it isn't taking microsoft that long to fill that gap yeah but also still it's games are not being built on you know a game studio is not going to pick windows as its platform yet we're not quite there yet. When when G was opening the door and people say, oh, maybe it's possible. But mm. it, my memory is still people were picking DOS. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, so now we uh, at what point do you see? Uh, and I should ask because we did talk about this in our conversation, Sorban, and this goes for both of you. The idea of using the specialized APIs pre-3D hardware uh, for game development. So let's say up until about 96. I, is 96 a good time? 95 maybe? Mm -hmm. The first a few like the 3DO and Saturn add-on cards or 95, I think. But so 96, uh, up until that point, uh, what is the role of the APIs for software rendering? Well. It's one of the ways to package our software renderer. And uh, as a company, but before we came into Microsoft, we were doing a very fast software renderer. And that, that was the value. We'd hand, hand tune this thing so it, it really went quick. Um, so, so we had an API for that. But the other part of the value was that that could get you to games consoles quickly. So if we ported it to a games console, you could write something that on a PC, on DOS would hit the software renderer, do some great graphics on, on DOS, but if you you could also move it to a console more quickly. Gotcha. And the what is the impact then when these 3D, the GPUs, as we would call them today, the 3D accelerators, as we called them back then, uh, and please fill in any gaps if I'm making a jump here that is missing something important. Uh, what is the reaction as developers of both software and APIs to this news that these add-on cards are coming? Or how does it affect the development of the software? I, I'm not sure I 
totally understand the question. Maybe I can give a little bit of a historical context here, just to yes, be please. clear. So I think if you want to really understand the atmosphere of the time, the best way to think about it would be these are not really graphics cards, they're quake accelerators, because that is largely what everyone was looking at. So there was a tremendous amount of competition as to how many frames per second did you run Quake at? And there was a whole, there was all these sorts of things, like the reason 3D effects ended up being one of the major players in that time was they happened to run Quake at a very high frame rate and that sort of thing. So it's hard to really talk about it because you're talking about the literal chicken and egg part where it initially starts. And a lot of what it starts with is this is not really knowing what these cards need to do and trying to get a specific game that's very popular to show that you run that quickly or something. And it's it's hard to put your mind maybe back into that time period. But just to give you a very small example of why I'm trying to bring that up, if you take, a for example, the 3D effects versus the rendition Verite, uh, which were two very early cards that were in competition for who was gonna who was gonna survive, right? One of the huge things that happened at that time period was originally Quake was not expected to use a Z buffer. And in fact, John Carmack very specifically says that Z buffers aren't really necessary when talking early with people in 3D hardware. And he's right about the world rendering. But it turns out when Quake is finally finished that character rendering does end up requiring Z buffering. As a result, the rendition Verite, which didn't would have run Quake very well without Z buffering, but couldn't run it very well with Z buffering, versus the 3D effects, which had Z buffering built in and was kind of standard as part of the pipeline, you saw the rendition Verite not gain any traction because 3D effects was just that much faster. Now, there's lots of things we could talk about with 3D effects and, and Verite. That's just a very minor thing I'm pointing out. But I just want to underscore how not broad the evaluation of these 3D cards was in the mind of the kinds of people who are buying them. There, it was a very early, very specific, small thing that was happening where people were literally like looking at a very small range of games that were important. So anyway, Servon may have a different memory of it than me, but that was... That was kind of how it looked like to me anyway at the time. Yeah, I, I I would agree with a lot of that. I mean, there was a slightly different view before Quake came out because there was a lot of excitement about these cards, but there wasn't a, a big game that people really wanted that was using it. So it was more the cards were driving the mind share. So it was the other and but then Quake came around, came along, and then that suddenly there was something to measure, something you could look at that mattered. Okay. And so, okay, so in this historical perspective now, uh, as developers, as creators of an API, uh, from a, and we talked about this being one of the Im interesting or important aspects here is the time investment to adapt software for these different systems and as well as and this is probably actually chicken and the egg again before you're adapting uh, anything for these cards what does the support from the card manufacturers for the developers even look like i mean what's the relationship you've got these upstart companies suddenly saying, hey, you know, we're going to be marketing this thing here and we need games to run ours. What is that initial conversation with the hardware companies as software developers even like? Well, there was, there's two different points in time. There was um, uh, slightly earlier on, before Quake was actually out, that these cards were coming. Um, and it was before Rendomorphix, my company, before we were bought by Microsoft. There were three API vendors of which we were one of them. Uh, there were three, but they were all British companies. There was Rendomorphix, Criterion Software, and um, Argonaut Software. And those were the three APIs. And there was also OpenGL, but that was just seen as the high-end SGI stuff and games who weren't really taking it that seriously. 
because there wasn't really a way of making it go fast enough. So the choice for games in, before this was to use one of those three APIs. And then I didn't, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I didn't know Argonaut was actually selling their game engine or API at that point. Yeah, it's called B Render. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, it just caught me by surprise. Yeah, so there was, there was those three APIs, and that, there was a battle between them. And uh, we were all racing all three companies. So every time a new card was getting announced and coming out, we would have to write the drivers, and we were learning about it and building that into our API. And the game studios were deciding which APIs were the best for them and how, how they could build a game on it. Then there was the Rendomorphics acquisition and then we came into Microsoft and then the whole thing ratcheted up, up a gear because suddenly now Microsoft was getting behind an API. And that's when the question of OpenGL or is it a Microsoft API became a relevant thing because some people don't want Microsoft to own the API to the hardware. OpenGL was open. So that's when it, it got to a bigger game. Okay, and I think that that actually answers my next question, which was, uh, so Open OpenGL is basically pushed into this position of being a viable API alternative because of the size of Microsoft. No. I would actually say because, again, I would, I would almost say because of John Carmack. Yes. Uh, it, like... He was more enthusiastic about that as an API at the time, not necessarily because of the openness, but I think perhaps just because he saw it as being more aligned with what he was trying to do. I'm not sure he would be the right one to ask, but if he had said, no, I would prefer to use Direct3D, I think that would have been the end of the story pretty much, period. Okay. And now, for, game, yeah, for, think, games, for games, for yeah, games. Yeah, I, I think OpenGL was, was going to, was on the way down for games. It wasn't being taken seriously. Um, Direct 3D was being built and coming out. I think had Quake not ran on OpenGL then, I think there was a huge decision for the industry at that time. And I remember the waves it made within Microsoft when I was there and we were building Direct 3D. Okay, and uh, uh, could you be a little bit more expl uh, explicit as to what those waves look like? How did that <laughs> manifest itself? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some people were upset. Um, it's it's hard to say. I mean, it is. It was just a realization there was going to be two two people in the game. I mean, okay. before this happened, it was going to be a slam dunk. Everyone knew it would be Direct Three D. Okay. And it was so, it was John Carmack with what he did with bringing Quake onto OpenGL brought OpenGL into the into the game. Absolutely. Okay. And um, looking back, you know, it, it's probably a good thing. Uh, competition tends to be that, although if you're the one who has to suddenly compete, probably expletive laden emails or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so I have to ask now, uh, and this is where we're going to get into the technical weeds where I'm, I may just have to step back for a moment. Uh, from a developer standpoint, what were the pros and cons of OpenGL versus Direct 3D in that those early uh, early years? So let's say 95 through probably 97, uh, or or even earlier 94, uh, 94 through 96 maybe or so, in when they first really clash around the time of the launch of Quake. What are the pros and cons, or on a t from a technical standpoint? I mean, Servan, do you want to start or do you want me to start? It's difficult for me to jump into that. Maybe you okay. go for it first. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if, if Servan mentioned this beforehand, but, uh, you know, not, not more than five years ago. I don't know. Within the last five years, I, I sent email 
to serve on who we we don't talk typically like you know we we know each other but it's not like we send emails back and forth but i just randomly sent him an email out of the blue and i was like hey uh i thought you might like to see this api design from nvidia because it basically returned to execute buffers we finally got all the way back to execute buffers as the design for an api which is just like you originally thought uh it would be i thought you might like to know right um, and the reason that I bring that up is just because I think when you look at the OpenGL versus Direct3D thing at the time, I think it would be correct to say two seemingly contradictory things. One, that OpenGL probably was better designed at the time, but two, it was actually not very well designed for what you will eventually want. Direct 3D was the opposite. It wasn't really as well designed for what you might want to do immediately, but it was much better designed for what you might want to do 10 years out. Now, this is the kind of theme that I see frequently in the tech industry, and it's kind of an interesting cautionary tale, I would say, which is that you have to be careful not to be too right. If you're too right, you're too early. And I don't know how to say it any other way than that. But I want to say that the original design of Direct3D uh, is too right. It's It was right for the 10 years after that fact card, but not really right for the current card. And I think that is mostly how I would frame it. And before I go on, I'd, I'd actually ask Servan, did you want to comment on that perspective at all. That's kind of how yeah, I see it. That exactly fits our thinking. I mean, we were, I said it in the last talk, we were crystal ball gazing. And the value I believe we put into that API was our experience with all the cards, our experience with the hardware engineers that were making the cards. And then we said, okay, we've really learned about this stuff. And we had it, we were really ahead of the time with the, our industry experience. And we'd made a lot of versions of our driver, refining it and refining it for these cars. And when we were building Direct3D, it was like, wow, we get a chance to put down what could take us really into the future. So we we built an API that we thought really would last. And more than last, we were building an API that would make a template for the GPUs so it would guide them more rapidly in. Sort of, it was meant to be like, this is the landing strip for the GPUs to come and it would guide them to be this way. So that's what we, we saw as being important about doing that. But it made it much harder to use uh, for the initial capabilities of the early early hardware. Now, uh, and so everyone you... was like, why are we jumping through these hoops? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And I was like, but this is future proof. This is, this is where, where it's going to go. But that was a very hard uh, thing for me to explain in those days because I was talking, there was a very small niche of people that would even know what I was talking about because I was talking about something that didn't exist yet, that I was able to crystal ball gaze because of my experience with the hardware. So I couldn't even say, hey, there's hardware out that does this. I was saying there's hardware coming that's going to do it this way. And they were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Okay, so are we talking primarily, and obviously this is where we really do need to get into the weeds, and you guys are very, being very nice here about making it understandable to, uh, to a noob like me. What would be some of the examples of implementations or methods of doing the work that made OpenGL easier at the time? Uh, and Direct3D more circuitous or uh, with more in-between steps, uh, was it simply a difference of OpenGL was easier if you were making a game for people who did not have 3D hardware and were going to be doing stuff in software render? No, or was it, no, it was just more... draw a triangle. It was OpenGL had an easier way to draw a triangle. Okay, now... You had what you had a simple go call to do go that. Off on it. Okay, so explain explain what the process was, and if I don't understand it, do not okay. apologize. Go for yeah. it. OpenGL had a simple call. You would call a function with the parameters for a triangle, in effect. 
Uh, you had to do some setup, but you just called something to draw a triangle for you. In direct 3D, we didn't do that. And uh, what we'd been asked for by a lot of people in the industry was the lowest level that they could get that, that could do it fast. And so we provided an interface where you set out a whole bunch of memory with all the triangles laid out as instructions within the memory. So you as the programmer would build out this buffer, we called it an execute buffer, that had the triangles, it also had transforms and other things you could put in there. And you filled that in the memory, and then you pass that to the GPU, the graphics hardware, and it could process through that. That was the vision for it. But what that meant was you were building like an instruction stream in memory. Now it's much easier to say, draw me a triangle and test that. It's much, it's a, it's a little bit more, it's not a lot more complicated, but it's a little bit more complicated to write code that starts laying things out in memory, has jumps within that memory, and then calls it. It's not so easy to test it. Um, so it's it's a little harder to do. Now, I think the only mis the, the mistake we made was we assumed it would be simple for people to write some sample code that would wrap that with a draw triangle and put it in that memory. And we didn't provide the sample code for that um, in direct 3D. And we could have just had a, a layer of sample code that's just said draw triangle, but put it into memory because that's what other drivers had to do anyway. When you said draw triangle, what they would do is they would take the data from that was passed into that function call, write it into some memory with instructions that was then passed the GPU, and then that would do the same thing as what we were exposing. Gotcha. And Casey, you said that the execute buffers come back around uh, and that this was a future proofing. Can you explain what what changed or why that is now an idea <clears throat> whose time has come? Yeah, I would I would probably part ways a little bit with Servon here and say that I don't know that it was only ease of use. So there is a cost to the execute buffer as well. It's not a huge cost, but it is a cost because what you are doing there is you're sort of saying, well, there's going to be this prescribed way in which we're going to get these things out to the card. And in order to really take advantage of this, we're going to have to do some things like standardize on how the matrix format works and what kind of computations are gonna be going on here. And again, you have to cast your mind back to, I keep saying this, but it's true. You got to rewind back to what these cards actually were at the time. And I would I would very closely compare OpenGL Direct 3D with that 3D effects rendition verite difference there, in fact, as well. And the reason I would do that is because if you looked at what cards actually were at the time, there were two different types of cards that came out at that time. And maybe saying types is a little bit strong because the rendition verite may have been the only line of cards that was doing this. I don't know if there was another. So I, I maybe would say there was the rendition verite and then there was all the rest of the other types of cards. But if you look at what the design of those cards were, a rendition verite was basically just a CPU on a card. It's literally just another processor that you plug into your computer. And so in a lot of ways, it's exactly like what a GPU is today. Now it doesn't function exactly the same because there's a lot more complexity in a modern GPU. So, you know, take that with a huge grain of salt. But the fundamental idea of this is just a processor sitting somewhere else with its own dedicated memory that processes graphics commands, no matter what they are, no matter how complicated and weird they might be, we'll just do them. That's what a rendition verite is. So very similar to today's GPUs in theory. Then there's everyone else's cards, and that's like a 3D effects Voodoo or the NVIDIA NV1 or whatever those cards were. And these cards are like literally just pixel stream processors. So all they do is they literally have like a little pipeline that basically says, okay, do like a bilinear fetch, uh, compare with the Z buffer or something. Uh, well, I guess you would do the bilinear fetch after. So you can you know, read the Z buffer, compare the Z buffer, bilinear fetch, uh, blend the pixel, write the pixel. And it does like two pixels at a time or something. I think a Voodoo does that. I don't really remember. 
Um, and I think the Voodoo 2 could do like two bilinear fetches or something so that you could do Quake in one pass, blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it's a bunch of nonsense like this. And so when you look at the difference between those two cards, the 3D effects was a much better idea for that era because since they picked a fixed function, this can only do one thing, right? It only can do this one operation. Mr. Game Developers out there, whatever, please make it fit this thing exactly. Like, write your output to match this one thing we can do. That allowed them to run much quicker because they could do this, like, fully pipelined, complete system for just getting those, those pixels filled as fast as possible without needing any of the other elements of a normal processing unit. The rendition Verite, on the other hand, actually had to read instructions and it wasn't, as a result, very pipelined. So it stalls a lot on like what you're doing and takes a lot more cycles per pixel. So even if they ran at the same clock rate, a rendition verite would just go slower because of the fact that it, it couldn't be as seamlessly woven together, right? Because when you know exactly what something's going to do, you can save, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the reason I bring up that dichotomy is that sort of the same thing as D3D and OpenGL at this time. In exactly the same way, I would argue that Rendition Verite was the quote unquote correct design because that is how GPUs are designed today, right? In a very similar idea. You had to get to a certain point of maturity as to what a GPU can be expected to be doing before those trade-offs actually lead to higher performance. Right. Now, the same thing is true with D3D and OpenGL. D3D is basically incurring a cost both in the design phase, meaning the API is more complicated, but also in the processing phase because you have to build these execute buffers with a prescribed format. It can't all be hidden behind a single coral where the driver can do whatever optimized thing it wants to do for its thing. It's got to read a common format, like all this stuff, right? Um, there's a lot more complexity there that you pay for. In a modern world, the benefits you get from that extra complexity far outweigh the drawbacks in terms of performance. But in that day and age, right, because you were trying so hard just to get 30 frames a second on simple graphics, that fat isn't there. You don't have the room for it, right? So a lot of people, look at those two, they don't go, well, I'm going to make trade-offs here. I'm willing for the game to run a little slower because I want this to <laughs> last, right? They're, they can't do that at that time because it's just too tight. And so both things, the Verite and D3D's execute buffers are just a little too early because what they're doing is they're looking at an era where the GPU is going to do a lot more than it does today. And before it does that extra amount for you, it's just pure waste that you're doing these things compared to the fixed function version. And that's why I said at the beginning, there's a cost to being too right. If you know, if you build the thing that people are going to need 10 years from now, sometimes you actually lose because the, the nobody's caught up with you. Like, like it doesn't, right? And and you, it's unfortunate, but that's just, that's the reality of needing to get game performance today instead of doing the right thing for the long term. So Kate, now now you've provided all that information, it's, that's exactly how we were working. Um, when we were building the execute buffer, it was on, it was the verite that was encouraging yeah. us to go in that direction. We were working with the guys at Rendition and we had the 3DFX card and we could see this was a powerful beast in comparison, but it would have sent the APIs down a very particular route and we were being told build a general API that's going to future proof us. So we needed to make it broad and then Verite was there and it could actually do it. We were, but we were seeing it was slow. So when we actually had the driver up and running, um, it just couldn't couldn't match the performance, but it was doing the generalized execute. But that that's exactly that was the reason. Had that chip not been there, we would probably have focused more on one particular direction but because it was there we thought we could do the jump now and we thought next generation they're going to sort it out anyway and if that had happened we would probably have gone that route very much earlier right because 
it just so happens that Verite wasn't able to, and it would be interesting to hear like from some of their chip designers, because my understanding was they had a lot of problems that were not necessarily related to the hardware specifically. Like they were like, they had fab problems and other things. So for all we know, if that had not happened, uh, things might've been different. Another thing to keep in mind at this time is right now, anybody with enough money can fab the fastest the, on the smallest process. You can go to TSMC if you have a big enough wad of cash and fab the fastest chip in the world if you want to. That was also not true back then. Intel had the fastest foundries and then there were some, some other foundries around. It was a different landscape too. So it That's, wasn't yeah. a given that you could just hand cash to somebody and get back a small chip. That's important That's to remember as well. Exactly how I was seeing it at the time because everything was accelerating. You know, the, each company, these companies we were working with only had certain budgets to work with. So we'd be making a more general API and they'd be, oh no, don't add that generality. It's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be hard. It's going to cost us more money. But then when a, com a competitor came out, when 3DFX was able to do what they did with Quake, suddenly the budgets went up, the about investments went up. So everything started accelerating. So had we had the execute buffer be the way to go, it would have accelerated quicker we'd have we'd have made a jump quicker to that to that format but it, there was a more circuitous route we had to take to get there gotcha so i was just hoping to short circuit that journey uh, uh, and it was for a while the leader in this market is at least on the consumer side or at least that was my perception at the time. You guys may have had better access to sales numbers than, uh, than me as a player, but it was also one of the cheapest ones. I, that's one of the main reasons why I that was my first 3D accelerator. Now the uh, the Glide uh, API if, is calling it an API the correct term. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the Glide API is really just doing this one main thing uh one major change to the uh to the to the uh, games and uh the i i guess my question is what is the reaction inside the industry as far as game developers and api creators to this success um are what is the decision like if you're a game developer as to what are you going to support how much does it cost to support multiple apis is that even an option at this point uh, you don't want to support multiple apis <laughs> either you're okay. going to make a wrapper and you make your own api <laughs> that talks to the two apis below uh, but you don't you're gonna you've got to pick really Okay. I'm not sure I, I quite got the question. I'm sorry. Uh, so you're asking about how Glide specifically affected the industry or? Uh, well, it, yeah. So for example, if, if Glide is really just doing this one thing uh, and you're now going to make a game, uh, do you build it around the idea that you're just going to do, you uh, process the 3D and if, and again, I'm probably, Things were evolving very program. fast. The APIs were changed. Like as Casey said, there was Glide, but then OpenGL came out with Quake running on the 3DFX. So suddenly there was a more general purpose API. Everything was within it within about a year or two. There was a lot of changes. So it was very hard as a game developer to build and make the right decisions because the, the floor was changing all over the place. And uh, I guess I would point out a, a slightly related thing, which is Glide is really just OpenGL. I mean, it's not exactly, but it's very close. So game developers weren't really faced with like a huge like, oh, there's D3D and Glide and OpenGL. It's more just like Glide and GL because Glide is basically the same. So it wasn't, Glide didn't really complicate matters in quite the way that maybe it would have had they taken like a drastically different approach from both Servon and Kurt Ackley. And like, so it was like this, you know, totally different thing. Uh, it, it really wasn't. It was more just like a, a GL light is how I would maybe describe it. It's not that different. 
than GL. Okay, so that actually then that explains it. So, uh, and Servan, you were just saying how the territory is constantly changing. Uh, and around this time, also development times for games are getting longer and longer and longer. So that crystal ball of where are we going to be? I mean, there's a lot of games at this point that are still using the old Doom and Duke Nukem engine, the build engine type of techniques where you're not even really, you can't take advantage of a 3D card because it's not real 3D. Uh, and those games are still coming out after Quake and uh, and similar titles just because they were in development for so long. Mm -hmm. So uh, what what kind of advice or what kind of lobbying uh, is going on from the 3D accelerator manufacturers to the game developers? Uh, is there camps? Is NVIDIA supporting yes. OpenGL? Is uh, ATI trying to and back the, direct 3D? What, you, what does the politics of that? And you got to throw in the PlayStation into that as well. And let's throw PlayStation into that as that well. That was there, and it was doing. It didn't have a Z, but it was sorting its triangles. So you you were having to deal with that as well. Yeah, and it also had that weird trick where it was like only going from one scan line to the next. That's why if a character is just standing there and breathing, it's there's no nice smooth transition. It's the pixels up here or the pixels up here, and it's a very very jaggy look uh, on those systems. The main thing was no Z, no Z buffer on it. So gotcha. it could do fast triangles for its time. So that may, so, what, you, what you're talking about may just be like no bilinear filter might be what you're talking about. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I, no, I, it, oh, uh, uh, sorry. I, I watched a video explaining it a while back. I think it's um, it was only using integers. Oh, so okay. Like Integer transforms. Yeah. It was only doing integer uh, transforms. This was one of the ways to speed up the process. Yeah, yeah, that's and how a lot of the old engine, our old engine, the fast, we would have an integer pipeline. Is one of the things we would provide for people. All the old games did it that way. Mm -hmm. There would yeah. be fixed point mathematics for all of the 3D. Gotcha. So, uh, but back to the question of the politics, I mean, uh, John Carmack uh, decides OpenGL is the way he, he becomes the evangelist. He becomes the face of OpenGL. Uh, and what what is happening on the direct 3D side? I mean, uh, does this split the the game developer community? How what's the the fallout? Well, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen here, and I guess I don't know <laughs> where you want to go with that. So, uh, with, first of all, uh, yes, there's relevant. Th okay, there's obviously a lot more evangelism of all kinds in that era because games are like more nascent on these platforms, both in terms of on 3D hardware and on Windows, because before they were all just software graphics on DOS. That's what games were on a PC. So, so everything is emerging. The platform, like Windows and the the graphics cards are all emerging and they all have a lot of evangelism. And the easiest way I can illustrate that, I think, is uh, to, to point out two things. One is that everybody I knew, including me, who was a nobody, nobody would have known who I was or anything. So I'm just a random guy, had like stacks of graphics cards on their desk that just got sent to them. You would just get, you know, your company would get 16 NVIDIA cards would come in a box, right? That never happens today. I mean, I don't know, probably only the very highest end of highest end people are getting graphics cards sent to them for free anymore, right? It's just, but literally stacks of everyone would just send you, here's N of this, here's N of that, right? Uh, and you would just get these boxes. And even if you're a small game developer, maybe you get less, but you get one in the mail uh, if you if you know anybody at all, right? Uh, and so that's one thing, just to underscore how much they were trying to get you to use these things, because they knew that if you had that in your dev machine, your game would run well on their card. So they were just like, put them in your machines, please. We will send you them as soon as they're out every time. Here you go. Uh, so that's one thing. And number two, 
is that at this time, for example, on the platform side of things, Microsoft used to have the most elaborate, most ridiculous developer parties that you've ever seen. They had one where they turned all of the Red West campus into a giant haunted house and Guar performed in a custom giant, like weird monster suit that they had made. They had a Roman gala like thing at the GDC where they had all these giant tables full of food and Alex St. John was up there dressed in a toga. I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, I would walk into these things and, and I'd be like, what the heck? Like, this is the most undignified thing I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, it was it was definitely very different because you can't imagine today, you could imagine a party like that and you could imagine evangelism like that perhaps, but it would not be for this. It would not be for trying to get you to use an API for games, right? It just, it would be very unusual uh, for that. Maybe crypto, right? Like today that would be crypto. They're trying to get you to put NFTs in your game, right? That kind of stuff was happening for this. So if that gives you some perspective on what we're talking about here, it, it was like that in terms of evangelism. I don't know if that answers the first part of the question, maybe. It, it, it gives me a very good idea of, the extent of the efforts it also okay. creates a very weird connection universal connection between crypto and graphic cards going way back <laughs> yeah. and excessive partying so there's something about graphic cards and outlandish claims and events perhaps um but, i'm but, sorry i forget what the rest of the question was you can well, it, it, i just want to answer well, that part first yeah. about the evangelism if you had the, a different question and i think that answers the question and uh Servan, since you were at microsoft uh, maybe you can give some insight into the thinking and uh, the the politics or the decision making that was going into basically hiring Gwar. Uh, I was I was not involved in the uh, evangelism side of things. <laughs> <laughs> I would just hear what was happening, and it was there was some pretty crazy ideas. Okay, uh, now the. So as a developer, uh, if, if you're basically being flooded with this imagery, getting handed all these video cards, uh, what is the deciding factor or what are some of the deciding factors on which of the APIs to support? So in, in some sense, I think that a lot of it really didn't end up mattering all that much for the reason that it ended up coming down really to, to matters other than these. The way to think about it, I, I, I think one way to think about it, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong about this, I'm just trying to form a pattern out of it, would be this exact time period also overlaps with where you start to have a lot more developers involved in the engine side of things. Meaning, if you look at what happens today, you're not going to have an engine team of two people, probably, unless you're like an indie game developer, right? Um, Uh-oh, we've lost. Are you still there, everyone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're probably, you know, if you look at someone like, you know, you talk about like Rockstar or Electronic Arts, right? They have like dozens or hundreds of developers who might be touching the engine side of things, at least dozens, right? So if you look at going from a time period where one or two developers might make it the engine, meaning they're actually working on the thing that renders triangles on the screen and so on, to one where we're talking about like, even just the core graphics team might have 10 people on it or something. Um, when you get to that point, suddenly supporting multiple graphics APIs is like a non-issue anyway. You could just do that if you wanted to. Like we can support all these APIs, we don't care. It's not a big deal. We can assign some guy to do that and it's fine, right? Um, and so really what I would say made the difference was mostly the fact that uh, the reason for example, I think D3D is is really the more used uh, API on Windows now is primarily just because the support was better. Microsoft did a better job supporting it 
uh, and it was more reliable uh, to use. I think if OpenGL had been, that's what we would have used. So I think it came down to actually execution more than anything else because it just D3D just worked better. Uh, and that at the end of the day, that's what developers care about most. If there had been a really good reason to support both, people would, and sometimes they do still. And if they really don't feel like supporting more than one or don't think there's a reason for it, then they just pick the one that's, you know, better supported. I should point out, because I don't know exactly, like, how we want to talk about this, the the early design of Direct3D got replaced by Draw Index Primitive when, I guess, Servon left and Nick Wilt was yeah, it's then... Yeah, when, when, when I left, it changed. Okay. And so at some point there, it became like they're basically very similar APIs as well. There's not a huge design difference between them. So literally people at that point are kind of just going like, which one of these things is more reliable? And D3D generally was. So I, I was under I was under a, a lot of pressure because people wanted there to be like a draw triangle call that would make it easy. And uh, I didn't understand. I said, you could just make some sample code that does this. Um, but then my contract was was finished and I, I wanted to move on. It changed to draw index primitive, but then again, it, it kept evolving. So I think the early days of D3D was hard on developers because of these changes. It was still bedding in. You know, it would have been better if you wanted something stable to be on Glide and the, the early OpenGL implementation and then wait out for this stuff to bed in. And then once Microsoft decided how they were going to do it, then it'll be, the support's going to get better and better. Everyone's going to agree the hardware is going to, going to back it up. I just think it was a shame there was the unclarity in the early stages but then people suffered because of it. Understood. Now, the... I guess that, do you think in retrospect, had Microsoft not been backing it, would that API have had the chance of surviving long enough to get past that? Or, uh, so I guess that's my general first question. Had people chosen Direct3D without Microsoft's backing, given the OpenGL option. Uh, and uh, so that's, I guess, a general question for both of you, and then more specifically to Servan, would you have done something different or would you have changed had you not had the backing of Microsoft, given the market conditions once OpenGL well, enters the picture? I can't quite get the question because Direct3D emerged because Microsoft had a particular agenda. Well, but you had, uh, but the core of it had already been uh, available at Render Morphics, right? Not, or not really. That, we that's... we designed the execute buffer thing for what Microsoft wanted to do with hardware, as uh, Casey okay. described. Okay. Uh, we saw Microsoft wanted to build hardware into the future, lay out the groundwork for that, and that's what we did. Then, um, the stuff with Glide and st started happening, and there was a pull towards the games right now, rather than something slightly more long term. And then the API was sort of trying to find its feet for a while, so it needed to change, and it morphed, and then it stabilized in later versions. Okay. But uh, all of that was really the early days of Microsoft trying to find out where it was trying to place itself with this, and the hardware was still forming its shape. The shape of how the GPU was going to talk to games was still forming. Whereas individual games, they just needed something that worked that was stable. Right? The draw triangle was the right way to do that and buffer you from these changes. But the driver model, which was the, the critical part uh, that would enable the GPUs to evolve to a more sophisticated level, that's the part I was interested in, enabling a driver model that would give the GPU manufacturers the most headroom to move forward as quickly as possible. That's what well, that was my job. Uh, so I built D3D for that. OK, and OK, so and and I'm sorry, I, I, for some reason that uh, I was thinking that the execute buffer concept, for example, was <clears> something that predated um, uh, the takeover by Microsoft. No, we, we had a different way of doing things. There were some ideas where we would we would do that, but it it came about from 
us at Rendomorphics supporting various chips, the rendition being primarily one that allowed us to go in that direction. And then when we came to Microsoft, rendition was still around and going strong. And uh, it took us in that direction because it fitted with the requirements we were given as, as developers to build Direct 3D. Gotcha. Uh, so, and to the question from a developer standpoint, had Microsoft not been backing it, would the immediacy of quick results for the hardware of today made uh, Direct 3D less attractive than it actually than it ended up being? I think you would have got a lot more API wars because if Microsoft hadn't backed it, there wouldn't be Direct 3D. There would be Glide. There would be the other um, hardware companies providing their own APIs, and they would be partnering with. There were three companies at the time, so there'd be three APIs plus OpenGL. So there'd have been four APIs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to choose. Oh, sorry. If you want to talk more broadly about kind of the situation we ended up in, I would actually say that if one other thing that was not known at that time that is uh, appears to at least to be obvious today is in the world of Windows gaming, there are only three chips you will ever run on. You're either going to run on an NVIDIA, you're going to run on an AMD, then ATI, or you're going to run on an Intel embedded chip. Like, that's it. There's nothing else to run on anymore. And so if you look at the way things went, it's entirely possible that a better choice for everybody, if we had known that, would be, hey, GPU manufacturers, you just provide your own API for your hardware, because as developers, we'll just program to those three APIs, and we'll just have a back end for each of those. That may sound ridiculous, but... If you look at what happens today, we basically do the worst, the even worse version of that. We have to program to like direct 3D, but we have to tune it for each of those vendors. Then when we port to Mac, we have to do use metal and tune metal for each of those vendors, right? So you have like these weird, like that you're now doing way more work then if I could have just taken one thing and known anywhere that this card is, whether it's on Mac or Linux or PC, I just program it the same way, that would have been way more efficient. So if we'd just gone with GPU APIs, it probably actually would be a better world. But back then, when you were looking at it, what you saw was like, oh, there's all these other vendors. There's S3 and there's Matrox, right? There's these, we're thinking five, six, seven video card manufacturers are going to be in the yeah. mix because that's what uh, that's what's been happening, right? That's what was happening when these cards were only 2D. And so I don't think anyone at that time could have predicted how challenging 3D would have been and just how few people would end up surviving. So nobody would have thought that was the same plan in those days. But in retrospect, man, it would have saved a lot of effort, but but there was no way to get there was no way to do that then. You, that's only something you could have said today, right? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and so how uh, now you talked about a, a lot of effort going into these customizations for the individual cards. Uh, and uh, there's something that comes up several years later, around 2002 or so, when NVIDIA introduces CEG, their own little shader coding language, and ATIs got, I think it was uh, Smooth Vision and True Form and all these other little uh, tweaks to directly access functions that are popping up in the cards that the APIs can't keep up with. And this is, I guess, going to be one of the questions uh, for both, uh, uh, for both you, Casey, as far as the development of the software and Servon, if this was already a problem when you were developing uh, Direct 3D, uh, the, the cards, chips were uh, getting updated relatively quickly, and the, the iterations of the chips were coming out, if not yearly, um, uh, more frequently than that, and each time with slightly new functions. Uh, how How did you guys approach trying to 
add functions to the API or adjust the API for all these new chipsets and new functionalities that were coming out? Was this just something that, well, the API had these functions built in for software and it just had to be rerouted through a driver to the hardware or and or am I completely misunderstanding the problem again, which is definitely a possibility. Well, these conversations happen quite early because if uh, IHV, the hardware vendor is going to add these new features, they'll be talking to your Microsoft or. You know, very early to make sure they can get them in. So you'll be hearing about that, and if the, if it's going to cause a problem for the API, they'll be talking to you before they've started committing big resources to it. So they'll they'll those conversations will be happening. You'll at, at Direct 3D we'd be putting in support for them, or they would be rethinking how to do what they're going to do. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, from a developer standpoint the number of effects and so forth that you want to uh, add or activate, I guess, in the games, uh, how do you even adjust for that? Uh, is it just, you know, add it all in and let the player tune stuff until they get the right frame rate? Or uh, what is the understanding of, you know, how current do we have to be at the launch of the software? Well, uh, it depends really on what time period you're talking about. Uh, it gets progressively less important every year, is I guess the way I would say it. So with the initial release of Direct 3D and, and you know, the 3D effects, the Voodoo uh, and the rendition Verite and all that, I would say that, that at that time you wanted as little difference between what you were doing and what the hardware is affecting as possible because every little last drop mattered because this is a time when games barely looked like anything and they were big like giant polygons on the screen with very low resolution texture maps running at a low resolution on the screen so anything you could do to improve what was going on was a huge deal. I mean, things as simple as the Unreal Engine started using detail texture maps, which is a second texture fetch that shows up at a higher frequency than the main texture to add a little more detail to textures was a huge, players, this was a huge deal at the time, right? Like that was, oh my God, amazing. No, no one, no player knows whether you're using detail textures anymore, or anything like that. That's like so far from, so you think, but at the time this was like, oh my God, right? So. You know, when you think about stuff like that, it goes from there to today when you can release a pixel art game in 2D that's like, you know, game of the year or something made by three people or whatever, because at some level, the industry now just kind of assumes that there's some juggernauts who output these like very photorealistic games with lots of art resources plowed into them. And then there's a smaller end that, that you know, just does their own thing. And it's unclear how much anyone really cares about this stuff. With every year, it seems like they care a little bit less. So there might be some argument to saying that, like, yeah, if you're if you're Sony and your first party, you know, if Guerrilla Games really just bears down on the PS5 hardware and gets this amazing looking Horizon Forbidden West out, that's a, a great thing to launch your console. Okay, so there's a place where it still matters. But to a large extent, the sales of your game, I don't know how much any of this matters anymore. It's almost all happening in on the other side of things, which is how much art budget do you have? What's your pipeline look like? Are you able to do these huge production schedules and actually get them out on time? All of that stuff started mattering way more than, am I taking advantage of every little feature of this 3D card? So it's not to say that it doesn't matter at all, but it's definitely muted. And so I think you have to really just understand that it's a huge gradation there. And so if you want, I can try to pick a time period and answer the question you had, which is how do you do it? But I think it's more important maybe just to, for the takeaway to be that it matters less and less um, in, in a lot of ways. Gotcha. And I think uh, that transfer over time is probably, as you said, the best takeaway. Now, if we were going to pinpoint 
the moments when the, this is really, really big, where the differences between the cards are greatest, we're probably talking 96, 97, where, where you know, you, you nobody really understood what these cards were even doing, let alone what the, the possibilities of the card were. And it seemed like every week when Unreal came out, I remember, you know, the, the for the menu system where you're flying around the castle and stuff and everybody going gaga over that. Uh, so I guess if we are talking in that period, 96, 97, what, or 98 even, what is the decision-making process? Because if you're going to have this extra layer of uh, textures or not, is going to be partially dependent on the performance of the cards, I'm guessing. Even though I think Unreal also did it fairly well in software render, but if memory serves you, me right. Yeah, you you do multiple paths. You just literally have multiple paths in the back end. And at that point, you absolutely did. Um, because you already probably had software rendered and not at a minimum, right? So you have to have your software rendering path and your, I call someone's API path. So adding like two paths or, you know, some variants on the paths, you've already architected your stuff to have to do that. So it's not like at that time period, you were going to get away with just having one backend anyway, because you probably had to ship with a software renderer unless you were doing some kind of an, a pack in with the 3d effects card or something where you knew right that it wasn't so except unless you had a very specific uh, case or arcade machine i guess would be the other case like we mentioned um there could be some times maybe similarly if you were console exclusive if you were only going to be on a playstation or only going to be on a dreamcast a saturn or whatever n64 then you knew that that you could have just one back end but in general Anyone who does cross-platform development already had to do that kind of stuff. So it wasn't really that big of a deal, I wouldn't say, even then. Gotcha. And uh, how big of a role was the increasing ability to ship out patches uh, through over the internet uh, for this? Because one of the big examples was the original Tomb Raider when it shipped uh, for PC it had no support for 3D accelerator cards and that was only made available through patches online. Uh, did th that did that come into consideration in these longer projects or not? I hadn't thought about that. I I couldn't tell you. I, okay. I think not till a bit later. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Servan, when we talked last, uh, one of the topics that you mentioned that might be of interest here was some of the decisions that you had to make in the headers of the uh, of the API uh, and all right. I think we've been covering. Oh, OK, covered OK, much. OK, OK, uh, then I guess uh, and this is where my knowledge of it is getting out. Is there any uh, more larger technical questions with the original start uh, those early, early periods of the APIs that uh, bear analysis here? Well, I, I mean, I guess you, there's one broad point that you could make, uh, which I didn't hear Servan make, but I know that he made it at the time, uh, which is that underlying all these decisions, uh, there's kind of this, uh, this ec there's an understanding of memory bandwidth or bandwidth between components. Uh, if I remember correctly, the one of the reasons for the original Direct 3D design, as Servon explained it, was that bandwidth was going to be a huge issue. So you wanted to be able to minimize the amount of bandwidth that you are taking from the host to the graphics card. Is that a correct, a fair statement, Servon? I guess I'd totally. say everything's about bandwidth for performance. And so I think that that was something that wasn't really mentioned, but it underlied the design of the original Direct 3D, and it's what motivates a lot of the current design as well, which is why I said it kind of comes back around. And just to underscore like why this is important or what this is about. So in the original way that these cards worked, like the 3D effects card, really all that you're going to do with that card is you're feeding it a stream of vertices for triangles that have already been transformed into screen space. And then it's going to just fill in the spans of that triangle with texture mapping. That's like all it's doing, right? 
And so what that means is there really isn't any way to minimize any bandwidth of anything. You are going to send exactly that down every frame. You're going to send the screen space position of your triangles, which means that again, an architecture like the original Direct3D doesn't do anything for you. It only gets in the way. However, fast forward a little bit of time forwards to a time when instead there is extra memory on this 3D card and it now has the capability to transform things itself. So you don't have to send down screen coordinates anymore. You can store raw data of some kind and then just tell it, oh, I need to do these transforms to it and then it can be drawn in screen space. Well, now, if you were to send down all of those screen space triangles every frame, that would be a tremendous bottleneck because you're having to transfer this huge amount of data for every triangle on the screen, you're sending down data. Whereas what you could have done is just sent down a chunk of that data once in its original untransformed form. And then each frame you just send down a little piece of information that's like, here's the transform to use for it this frame. That make, takes the bandwidth from some very large one, two, 10 megabyte chunk all the way down to just a few bytes, right? 32, 64 bytes or something like this, right? And that is what Servon, if I understood him at the time, was designing for correctly, like I said, because that's exactly where we ended up, is wanting to do exactly that. But you can see why up until the point where you can utilize that advantage, you're not getting the advantage. You're just paying the cost, but you're not getting the advantage. And so that is where you start to kind of see these, you can't be too early because no one can see the correctness of the design because it's not it's not paying off, right? Um, mm -hmm. They only see the cost they're paying for that. And it will take a few years for things to get to the point where you pay off. That is, so, so understanding that bandwidth trade-off, that sending things to the card costs you something. So you want to minimize the amount of that transfer that's going on. That becomes a fairly important thing later on. And it just wasn't originally. And that's that's part of why that design was a mismatch early, but would have been correct later. Casey, that's a great explanation. Thank you for that. <laughs> no problem. It's something that um, we learned from the early days of Rendomorphics making very fast rasterizers because we used to, one of the things our company led the field in is we could make software go faster than hardware and the way we did that was how we minimized the bandwidth and uh, we found that we could in our software rasterizers we could transform light and render the triangles as fast as the memory you could read as fast as you could read the memory and that meant that we started realizing that the bottleneck was not about how fast the CPU went. So then we started rethinking the way we actually design our architectures. That they, you can, if you design your architecture and you've got to assume you have an infinite speed processor, then just look at where the memory bottlenecks you. And then that sets you a hard limit to your architecture because you've got the, the reality of how fast you can read that amount of data from the memory and move it. If you design your your algorithms and your architecture around that, then you know you're future proofed. But if you've got this huge amount of memory that you've got to move, we could see that you know in a few years' time, the GPUs are going to do transform and lighting. That's obvious. So let's build an interface that's going to work for those. So that's what we did. But uh, it's, it was exactly this: that it was a little too far ahead, and uh, the needs of the day where like, we need to go really fast right now. And uh, that's what led to the, it was just different levels of understanding and different goals. The yeah. other place where this comes up uh, in that history is the shaders. So it's the exact same thing with shaders, actually. You can understand a lot of these decisions from a bandwidth perspective, from a purely bandwidth perspective. So if you look at the reason why we have shaders on GPUs at all, what's the point of this? Well, you could, and in fact, we had, this actually exists, uh, with the right combination of blend modes, 
you can just draw everything with a basic fixed function pipeline that uses blend modes to compute the final result in pixel space by just doing multiple passes. You just pass after pass after pass after pass to some number of buffers and how many buffers you will need depends on the algorithm. And you could do everything with fixed function. You could do that. Why do we need shaders? Because there was actually no one knew at the time which one was going to be faster. I mean, I shouldn't say no one knew. Uh, those of us who were ignorant about these things didn't know which would be true, right? Um, so you could have done that. Multi-pass rendering can compute anything that single pass rendering or smaller pass rendering with shaders can compute. So why do we have shaders? The reason is bandwidth again. If you can load some things into the C, the well, the GPU core in this case, do a bunch of math ops on them right there, then just output a final result. What you've done is you've saved a number of reads and writes from the frame buffer. So it's the same mathematical computations, but the total number of reads and writes goes down. So that is why shaders are better, just over, they're just a better architecture, right? than multi-pass rendering because shaders by their nature can leverage a single set of pulling things in, doing a bunch of math ops on them then and writing out a final result rather than having to do like, load the stuff in, do the one or two math ops that we do in one pass, write it out. Load them in again, math ops out. Load them in again, math ops out, right? And so shaders are just another way that we can serve bandwidth. They're a way of, architecting hardware to minimize the number of, of actual trips to memory or to caches that we're doing. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's the same same idea. Right. Okay. Uh, and was there a an OpenGL, I guess, is not, not being future-proofed or isn't future-proofed at this point? Uh, is Correct. there any attempt by... An, as far as I understand the OpenGL, there's a committee that uh, decides on changes, official changes to the API, even though it's open source. So uh, what was the strategy that they were implementing or at least claiming to want to implement in order to deal with this future proofing issue? You're talking about when shaders were introduced. Uh, well, uh, just, Overall, let's say from the period of 95 forward, I mean, was there a, an attempt to deal with these issues head, long, head on that they were seeing with Direct3D or was it more a, oh, those guys don't know what they're doing. They're just messing it up and this is we're going to keep going on the path that we're on right now. You would probably have to ask somebody who was there, uh, but... I would probably say broadly the best way to understand it is you just have two sets of fighting people. One set of fighting people is like it, what Servon was doing. There's people inside Microsoft and they fight amongst themselves and maybe someone wins or maybe they don't. And it's not necessarily based on technical excellence. It could be based on other things, but there's a there's one fight going on there and the IHVs will all come to Microsoft and they'll try to pitch, hey, you should do this in your next API. And then some of the internal people to Microsoft will say, we don't want to do that or we do want to do that. And then they'll fight amongst themselves and who knows what else. The output of one of those fights is D3D. OpenGL is a bunch of IHVs get together and argue with themselves in a committee where Microsoft, I think, is there. Uh, so it's it's a still has similar representatives. <laughs> but they're different people uh, and they have a fight. And these fights are, they can take a lot of forms. There are things like people, you know, Microsoft required, I think that you, if you have patents on something, you won't sue another DirectX implementor for violating those patents on the API or something like this, right? And OpenGL had to do a similar thing. I don't know exactly what they did, but I think they ended up with an IP sharing agreement for these reasons because these fights are not just technical. They're legal, they're business fights, they're uh, asymmetric knowledge fights. You know, somebody doesn't want to tell somebody else that they've got these new things coming. So, you know, 
it's yeah. any explanation I'm going to give about what people did or didn't do is just going to be wrong because really what it was was a bunch of weird interpersonal business stuff that was happening and we got what we got. Did right. OpenGL have to respond to D3D's shader stuff? Absolutely, because it was critical. But how did that happen? I have I have no idea in practice. Yeah. That's a great answer. <laughs> It's, it's the only thing I can say. <laughs> no, it's great. It's, ex um, it's exactly how it is. Yeah. Uh, well, in the Servan, you had already mentioned in our previous conversation, uh, and you also hinted at it here, obviously, there was some uh, infighting over, you know, which department in Microsoft was going to take care of what, and where was this project going to be, and then people wanted to get their hooks into it and uh, the politics of it being one of the reasons why you did not stay on or extend your contract with Microsoft. Uh, now, did, and this I guess goes a little bit more towards the conversation about the long-term effects of uh, these APIs on the industry as a whole. Uh, were there any influence um, from the big publishers? because you did have, you know, the heavyweights like the Electronic Arts, uh, Activision in this early phase is not as big yet, uh, but you do have the console publishers and so forth out there. Uh, is there any kind of lobbying from them as to what should and shouldn't be in there or how the API should be structured? Are they trying to get in on this? Not, not really, because they don't know what there is out there yet to comment on. It was all so nascent, it was all just being born. So it was more people trying to hold on to their positions of power within the, either the IHVs or the old API vendors. Everyone wants to still be at that party, so they're all trying to hold on to what they have and say, well, I'm still relevant because. So the publishers came in a bit later because the 3D hardware was just, it was all being born. So while it's being born, there's nothing to fight over unless you think you own some of what's being born because your piece is valuable in it. Gotcha. And so coming out of the nascent period, coming into the later period, when uh, uh, we've, we've got the two APIs are basically settled, uh, companies like 3DFX and so forth fall away uh, or become irrelevant by the year 2000, 2001. Uh, so we're coming into a new era. The console 3D hardware has also gotten much, much better. Uh, and uh, there we have new levels of middleware and game engine. Uh, game engines have come a long way. Uh, what is the role of the API as this entire middleware uh, industry really gets going? Uh, 2000, 2001, 2002 with um, programs like renderware, the game engine for PS2 and so forth. Is And this is obviously from the point of view of a consumer where I would see these terms being used for a variety of products. Uh, what is the role, does the role of the these two APIs change as the middleware industry takes off? Well, Renderware used to be one of our competitors at Rendermorphics, and they got given a new lease of life when the PS2 came out. I think once Microsoft bought Rendermorphics and Rendermorphics disappeared and we started making direct 3D. Um, the two competing APIs that we had, vRender and RenderWare, I think they thought they were going to disappear. But RenderWare on PS2 got a very nice implementation together quickly and it really started working. So suddenly they had a reason to be alive and uh, it gave them a whole new lease of life and they were solving a very real problem. Um, but then middleware on top of that, it, it started morphing to the much bigger engines that were more pulling together lots of pieces. It started becoming more about the tool suite of how the tools, the editor, and 
all of those things were pulled together. So as games got more sophisticated, it stopped being about the rendering. So RenderWare, I think, was the last stop where it was really about the rendering. And then it became about the asset pipelines. It was really starting to be all about how you're going to bring the art, how you're going to deal with all of that, and the tool chains for that. And then the whole thing was, again, one step up in scale. The teams, the scale of everything was just another notch up. And so it morphed again. Okay. And did the role of the APIs um, uh, stay the same? Did you, uh, did, and obviously, uh, sir, when you weren't there anymore um, at Microsoft at this point, but uh, do we see then the APIs having to take on more of this pipeline role or uh, a bigger role in managing uh, things, or it, d does it stay right where it is, where Direct3D and OpenGL are, are just the, the interfacing with the uh, hard uh, with the hardware? Yeah, they just they're just talking to the hardware. It's just the early days, there was just like where, what level are they? How do they expose the hardware? What shape is the hardware? Because the GPU was still forming itself. Um, and like I said, the question, I think Casey summed it up really, really well. It was about memory bandwidth, but the first GPUs, the first, I won't call them GPUs, they were rasterizers. The yeah. first, D3D was built for GPUs. The execute buffer we designed was for the idea of a GPU. We didn't call it a GPU, but we had a notional idea of what this architecture was. We even built uh, within a diagram in-house, we had a, a, a GPU design. It was of the transform, the lighting, and the rasterization. We had the image of what, what that chip would be. We designed for that. Um, but what was better for the very first games that were coming out on hardware was a draw, draw triangle call in the GL style uh, that could get fast to it. But where things were going was was the GPU model, and it was really just about the APIs for that and how that evolved. Gotcha. And uh, seeing as you had conceived of the things that this was going to be able to do, uh, was it was there anything in that original conception of a GPU? that uh, took much longer to implement than you expected or may still not have been implemented in modern GPUs? No, I think we've gone well beyond it. Uh, is there anything, yeah? We, we went as far as um, transform and lighting and all the matrix multiplications happening on the GPU. Now we're, we're a lot further on than that. <laughs> It looks, I looked, I recently looked uh, back at the D3D header files that we'd written um, to look at the interfaces when you suggested we talk about this stuff. And it's like, it does look pretty primitive compared to what's going on today. Um, okay. And what would you say is the most important uh, or I should say, do you think that APIs need to evolve further? Is there another step of functionality or usefulness that could not be conceived of back then, but something that they could do today that uh, would future-proof them going into the future? Is there something that we need to be looking at now that uh, is foreseeable, but maybe not practical yet, that should be added? And this uh, goes for both of you. You could vision out um, some future hardware, but you need some hardware players to be building it or to be wanting to build it. Um, and it's like the story I learned from Microsoft with direct 3d it doesn't work that way you have to address the needs today and addressing the needs today often leave you with apis that you have to fix later okay uh, so um, yeah we were a little bit um hopeful that we could sort of in a way do the right thing for the architecture of the future and it would be good for the industry 
but actually I don't think it was the best thing for the industry. For the industry of the time or for the industry as a whole long term? I think it was it was good for the industry long term, but I think the industry long term would have gone in that direction and did anyway with the bandwidth constraints. It needed to make those decisions anyway. We were just trying to be too far ahead and we should have just addressed the needs right now. But we didn't know how quickly it was going to change. We didn't know the time frames. One one takeaway there, at least for, for me, because I think about this occasionally because I remember it well enough and I'm like, it's interesting to see because you're like, this was the right design, but it wasn't quite the right design at the time. What would you therefore do? Because that means you knew, right? You did know what you wanted it to be eventually. What do you do? And to me, it kind of feels like the right takeaway is just, look, figure out what you think that 10 year one is, but also figure out what the today one is and then try to make the ramp, right? Like try to have your API have that ramp in it so that people start with what they need today, but you know in your head, because you guessed correctly, right? You know how you're gonna evolve that thing. So then rather than having what normally happens with APIs is there's all these like radical breaking changes as they go, right? Um, you can just, you don't have to do that because you knew you're like, okay, yeah, I get what you're doing today, but I see the future. So I'm gonna like intentionally make the design such that it morphs, right? Cleanly from here to there. So I do think that even though coming out with an API that's 10 years ahead of its time is a bad idea, if you knew that, it doesn't mean you shouldn't use that information. Like, I, th I think you can, right? Like, I think you can take advantage of that fact. I don't know. So, I, you know, like, like I, th I think that I, you, I... You can, it's yeah. just going to increase your development time. Yes, yes. Uh, and we, we were on a very short timeline and with a, yeah. not a huge team. Um, so that that would be the only thing that I would take away from it. When trying to do stuff today, I'm like, I try to remind myself like, oh, if I'm thinking too far ahead, don't throw that out. Like you probably still want that, but you do have to, you know, you do have totally. to bring it in because totally. otherwise someone else will come and beat you while you're waiting for that 10 year thing. That's just the reality of the, you know, it's an unfortunate reality, uh, but yeah. that's what, you know, that's what it is, right? So the, had the rendition been a lot faster, things would have been different, I think. But it, it, it could have just worked, right? It's like yeah. if 3D effects hadn't been there, because they yeah. right, they just happened to to you know have have picked the sweet spot, right? But if they hadn't yeah. been there, it would have been very different. Yeah. Well, and I guess this does bring up a question because uh when this they, these decisions, especially the execute buffer, is made it's because you have so many different manufacturers either already out or on the horizon with so many different ways of implementing it. I mean, the uh, Sega add-on board that was replicating uh, Saturn's quadrilateral uh, techniques was different, let's put it that way. It's a nice way of putting it. Uh, and had you not had all these different manufacturers with different approaches there, you wouldn't have even probably tried the execute buffer concept, correct? Well, no, we did the execute buffer because of it was the memory bandwidth issues. It was a design that was future proofed. And then we did have a card that could implement it. It was the rendition. Yeah. What we're saying is it just turned out that the 3DFX went a lot faster than the rendition. So a more customized way that just worked well for 3D effects was the hands down winner. So suddenly this future proofed execute buffer way of doing things was a hindrance. Why would you want to do this? Why is this but, getting in our way? We don't want this. So, but it wouldn't work yeah. with all the other generalized and, ways. NVIDIA does then ship a chip, you know, five years later or something, I don't remember when, that does the transform and lighting. And at exactly. that point, that would have done it because that at that point that is then the fastest chip but yes. it was just a little too too late coming on the scene right um that was pro, exactly pro the chip that was designed for that yes. was <clears throat> exactly the design for the hardware you know 
that was exactly the hardware for the D3D that we'd implemented in the very first version, but it came five years later. But Amusingly, it, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll say a, a weird thing that apparently happened. Uh, this was told to me secondhand, but I'll just throw it out there. So apparently the reason that 3D effects chips didn't do transform and lighting was because, because they were, in fact, the reason 3DX kind of went out of business in some sense is because they were so late to the hardware transform and lighting game. They were later than basically everybody else. And the reason for that was apparently because they thought that there was no way to be faster than Intel at the time at floating point math. They were like, Intel's going to be the fastest at floating point math. So it's always going to be better for us to just focus on rasterization and assume that as CPUs get faster, they're always going to be the fastest at transform and lighting. Yeah, I remember that. That's I what they that's saying. what they thought. I was told that from someone there. Uh, and that was a really bad call. Uh, they were totally wrong about that. But again, you know, uh, that just it's unfortunate because it like it led to this mismatch where you had the lead player in the space not thinking about transform and lighting. They should have been, and it was a mistake for them not to, uh, but they weren't. I can't for the life of me understand why they were thinking that. It's a very bizarre thing to think even in that era. Intel chips are x87 in that era. So they're the weird like 60 bit, I want to say. I don't remember how, or, or 80 bit rather, 80 bit yeah. floating point 80 stack. Bit. Yeah, 80-bit floating point stack-based x87 design. Like, why anyone would have thought that those would be the fastest you could do transform and lighting for games? Uh, like I very said, strange. At, that, at that time, the the budgets would have got higher and higher for adding all this hardware. The chip manufacturers didn't want to think about transform and mm -hmm. lighting. They were doing everything they could just to make the rasterization go fast. And it was really scary to think about adding floating point units like that to to these cores. It would have just like it was a whole new level. But the <laughs> budgets went up, and it yeah. did become a whole new level, multiple new levels. I suppose that could well, be it. Maybe it's yeah. just like they didn't uh, they didn't count on how just how big of a business this was, right? Yes, that, that's how I see it. I could see. I saw this happen even over the two years I was. I was at Microsoft in the few years before there was these steps of the scaling up of the hardware business, the scale of these companies, the budgets that was going in. Yeah, 3D was FX it? was always the cheap option. I mean, uh, was, I don't think so. Like, well, when I, uh, I bought it because I was on such a budget, it was a $75 card for the, the first one that I bought. First when? <laughs> Uh, this would have been 96 or 97. It was yeah, the same time Tomb Raider 1 gets ported to the PC. I bought it literally to play that game. And it was a $75 mail order. Couldn't buy it in a store. But it had been hmm. reviewed in Computer Gaming uh, World magazine. And it as like, you know, this is the cheap version. Uh, I think it only had like a couple megs of memory on it. But the 3DFX chip... It, was much much cheaper at least at that point once you get to voodoo 2 and voodoo 3 that changed dramatically maybe but hmm. uh, as far as 3d accelerators were concerned it was the cheaper option at least for a short while sorry what, what were you comparing it to uh i was comparing it i want to say it was probably an ati card i just remember hmm. uh, it was a long listing of the the current cards okay. uh and that was the cheap one that Okay. Yeah, it was weird. Um, again, the the consumer perspective here, uh, not knowing anything else, I just knew I did not want to play it with the software renderer if I could avoid it. Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, now I was wondering this whole discussion about uh, the different cards and the and that influencing the decisions. And we talked earlier about how there's really only three options for video chips nowadays for PC users. Uh, do you think that 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 serendipity of having the multiple cards, different approaches, giving you the option of designing around different methods, may be missing from uh, modern advances in the APIs just because 
there aren't companies experimenting and throwing out different approaches that somebody might be able to bet on? I think the budgets we're talking about, the investment the uh, in 3D now is huge. So people, if there was a new method, uh, there, there would be something new emerging and people would be talking about it. So, okay. Yeah, I don't know that there's, I mean, the graphics today is largely just, it's a CPU. I mean, it, it really is. Like, there's not like a lot of difference between these two things. They're architected around different core optimization principles. So your your the memory architecture is, and the cache and and the you know things like the register sizes and how they deal with latency and threading are all they make different choices, but fundamentally, it's the same thing, right? And so. I don't know how much variability we're really going to get. And I think that's kind of a natural approach or not a natural approach, a natural outcome, because fundamentally what we want to be able to do with especially things like visuals is be creative. People are trying to make lots of different things. And so programmability is very important. And this is especially true once they start to try and get into other markets, right? Like GPUs are not just for graphics anymore, they're for compute more broadly, which means even more creativity about what's being done because there's even entirely different sectors that are getting targeted or something. And so at that point, I don't, we're not really talking about graphics chips anymore anyway. What these things are is they're giant like FMAD engines with like a graphics, uh, sorry, a memory subsystem designed to hide memory fetch latency. And that's more or less what they are. And that's a very good complement to a CPU. But I don't know how much experimentation we really need in that space beyond what's happening right now. Uh, I mean, two or three players in that space is probably fine um, because we're not talking about, like, maybe there is some radically different idea that we should be pursuing. Um, and if that's true, then maybe you're right that if we had 10 players in this space, some random company but would be off trying that. But I don't know how plausible that is at this point because it really is a general purpose architecture now. Yeah, a good way of looking at that is is uh, AI and neural net stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's the sort of thing you're talking about. That's a new API. How's that gonna be moved to hardware? You know, that's the sort of thing. Interesting. Uh, I never thought of AI as an API, but that's actually. Uh, well, when probably... you're talking about it on a its own accelerator, and how that works with the graphics, because AI and graphics are getting more tied together. And I mean, there's already been changes, right? So there's now numerical formats supported in a GPU that are only there because AI would use them. Like exactly. almost nobody else would care about this numerical format because it's exactly the wrong kind of choices about precision that you would make if you were doing something like graphics, but it happens to be very good for AI. So, or at least we think it is, right? I mean, AI is still kind of in its early days, so maybe this will turn out to have been a stupid idea, but at the moment, right, it delivers benefits. So that's in there and that's an example. It's a very small, it's a very simple API change and a simple, like relatively speaking, hardware change. We're not dramatically changing the way that this thing works, but it is an example of something that's a that's a systemic change brought about because AI is big business, so accelerators want to be able to support it, right? Cool. Okay, uh, that I think ends everything that I can think of talking about this, but I would definitely want to hear any thoughts you guys still have on this issue. Uh, either from a technical standpoint or from a uh, market or industry evolution standpoint, uh, your your thoughts on what that battle, how would you sum up what that conflict between those two APIs and uh, the, uh, the choices the industry had to make, what mark did that leave on the industry as it stands today? Servan, what I'm asking for is, what do you believe your legacy is? Uh, 
I'm not sure what I mean. <laughs> that's not. And I just played a small piece in something. I think Casey's better placed to answer some of that than, than I am. I mean, it's it was just important to get the 3D hardware to move forward for the game industry. That's that's what we cared about. Um, to have 3D hardware there so we could have the games and the graphics available to us. That's what was important. I mean, yes, there were a lot of things that get in the way of that. There's a lot of things that get in the way of it being done well. Um, it Maybe it could have been brought forward, the timeline. Some things could have been a bit quicker, but we've got some pretty good. I mean, it's doing amazing stuff. By the way, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what is being done. And I don't think we could have imagined this this level of functionality back then in our wildest dreams even. I mean, it was really, I mean, it's it's really out there the amount of power you have on a, a GPU right now. Very and, uh, true. Yeah, the AI thing's another whole layer because that is being applied onto GPUs with the upsampling and upscaling. As you get more and more AI-based upscaling, I think that's the whole, whole nother layer that's gonna come. The actual style of the game, stops becoming so much something that's built by the developer and maybe something that the user can just dial in instead of just brightness and contrast and actually start choosing the grading of your movie <laughs> through AI and that's going to start appearing in your GPU. That is both scary and I want it now uh, emotions in me. So that would, uh, yeah. Okay, I, I think it's can't coming. Even imagine what that would look like at this point. But then again, well, I couldn't that's, imagine that's, what 3D that's was. That's your going to API that you're talking about that's needed. It's like, how do you actually start describing this stuff in a way that's useful that then the hardware can do something with? But it would be that, I think. Cool. Uh, Casey, any uh, thoughts on. Uh, these scars left behind? Um, I think it was probably broadly good to have two APIs. Uh, and I think that was, the reason I say that is because I think it gave, in a world where there was only OpenGL, so let's suppose that that Servant hadn't have done D3D or Microsoft hadn't have bought, hadn't been interested, they didn't buy Render Morphics, it wasn't going to be a thing, it was just going to be OpenGL. Um, certainly as I've gotten older, I don't know, I would have thought this at the time, but the more experience I have with committees, uh, the more I can pretty much tell you their output is low quality. Um, that's just, that's just kind of the way it goes. And so if it had only been one API and it was a design by committee API, which is, I think what would have happened had, had Microsoft never decided to get into that space which, you know, they didn't have to. Uh, who knows why they decided to do that? I don't necessarily know why they didn't just use OpenGL or something, right? But, you know, they see a benefit at that time, especially they saw a benefit to having an API that they owned because, you know, Windows was a backwards compatibility operating system that was all about install base and all these things. So, you know, it made sense, but, you know, I wasn't there when they were deciding this, so I don't know. But if they hadn't done that, it was just OpenGL and one API designed by committee, I do think there would have been risks of there being no place to go if you ended up with a good idea that just that committee didn't adopt or didn't adopt well or something, right? Um, and so having two places to go, like basically two places to go with your hat out for, right? Like to try and get your thing uh, into something that developers could use is pretty helpful because the only alternative to that was rolling your own API entirely, which some people like NVIDIA have been successful doing, but most other people have not been. Um, so I do think having two was good. And I would say that I don't know that there's any particular uh, larger things to think about there. It was harder for developers to have two APIs, but overall, I think it was probably better for the industry to have two um, in the long run. Yeah. 
honestly. Very cool. Uh, any other final thoughts before I think we wrap this up? This. I think we really, it was great to have you, Casey. To Thanks for inviting me. I, I love talking stuff. about it's it. Like... And I'm yeah, sorry I... that you, you were, I'm sorry you were right and nobody knew it at the time. Uh, we, we should have all been like, actually, this is good. We should just figure out a way to like patch around this for right now and then, and then sail into the future cleanly but but that's not what happened holding for memory bandwidth yep it's it, it's the right thing you got to think about it yeah build it and they will come or something like that and it's still happening i mean today literally you know when you look at something like ray tracing what is ray tracing there for memory bandwidth we could just re-render the entire sc screen from tons of different viewpoints and use those for reflections. But you know what? At some point, it becomes faster to just do the small number of computations you need to figure out just the color for right now than it does to do all these extra you know, rendering. So at some point, you cross from rasterization being more efficient than ray tracing to the other way around. And it's just memory bandwidth all over again. Right. Here's how you design your algorithm. You just assume an infinite speed CPU. Yep. You look at the speed of each level of your cache, and you look at the footprint of each level of the algorithm that you pass through, and you arrange it that way. And that's how you make things really fast. It seems so simple to just imagine a perfect <laughs> future where everything works wonderfully and then take it from there. <laughs> I think we really went to town on this subject. I think it, we covered it in a lot of detail. Yes, uh, I think so too. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so very much for coming in on this. Uh, this is a topic I think that uh, doesn't get enough uh, enough attention in the history of, of the industry. And uh, I hope that this uh, helps people understand what was what went into uh, making all of this happen that actually en enables much of uh, at least Windows gaming today. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Casey, where can people find your work? Oh, uh, you can just find me on Twitter, Simuratory, uh, or you can go to mollyrocket.com. That's, that's my company, but. Cool. Uh, links in the show notes as always. And uh, Servon, uh, where can people find what you're doing both in computing and not in computing? Uh, the computing project I'm working on is I'm looking at a simulation engine I'm building, a project called EarthSim. It's earthsim.tv. All about it there. And I'm exploring a simulator. <laughs> And the analog work that you're doing? Um, it's an off-grid community, lots of off-grid building and uh, solar power I'm experimenting with. So that's uh, another whole project. Cool. Uh, well, I'll try to put some links in the show notes to all of that as Great. well. Uh, yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, look forward to seeing everything that the the next big uh innovations uh after well everything we just talked about thanks for having us it's been a pleasure thank you